to live stream. There we are, all systems go. Good morning, folks. Welcome to Community Church of Boston. My name is Dean Stevens. I'm a longtime member and music director, and it's been my honor and privilege to host these virtual shows that we've been having for the last uh, 15 months or so. Um, these shows have shown us uh, the importance of continuing with the broadcasts of our programs, which we are definitely planning to do when we resume in the fall. This is our last program for the season, and boy, do we ever take it out with, with an enormous bang. Stevens Donziger, we're just so honored to have you with us. And not only you, but our favorite people's troubadour, from uh, Portland, Oregon joins us. David has, has also played physically in our space many, many times over the course of, of a whole bunch of years. And we are honored to have him as our music uh, this morning. Um, I wanna start with a little poem that reminds me of the topic for this morning. I usually sing it as a song and I recorded it on a CD that I finished about a year and a half ago. Its release was sort of kiboshed by, uh, by COVID, but um, this song is on that, uh, and I will recite it as a poem, and it's on that, that CD. This is called Pledge Allegiance to the Earth. As I have come to know this world from the moment of my birth, until the day my life is done, I pledge allegiance to the earth. From this world we have grown, planet, body, Gaia, home, learning to make peace with ourselves, realize we're not alone. As I have come to know this world from the moment of my birth, until the day my life is done, I pledge allegiance to the earth. We are all made of dust and will return someday. All of our weapons and our power, not so hard to wash away. And then again, the chorus says, I have come to know this world from the moment of my birth until the day my life is done, I pledge allegiance to the earth. As we live, all live. Flags and countries rise and fall. In the rhythm of this planet, I can hear my own heart call. And again, as I have come to know this world from the moment of my birth until the day my life is done, I pledge allegiance to the earth. I pledge allegiance to the earth. The words of Jay Mankita to open our program this morning and welcome folks as they, as they join and join and join and more and more. Uh, again, it's our last program and um, by the way, until I'm until the I fall, although we could we could change that. There's so much great stuff uh, and we could we could just decide we're going to keep keep meeting. There's also the issue of next year's program that we have to start putting together and making decisions about about what we're going to feature every Sunday and about whether we can whether we should have other events on weeknights as well. Um, I'm joining you from Camden, Maine. Um, my wife, who is about to retire in December, needs to get a, rid of a whole bunch of vacation time, use it or lose it. And so we are taking a pre-vacation vacation with our friends, John and Rachel Nicholas, who are upstairs uh, playing and singing. I'm gonna try to get them to come and crash the church and sing a song uh, later on. They're wonderful musicians. John is a fabulous songwriter. So here we are in Camden and, and uh, welcome everybody from uh, all the way to the West Coast down to Stephen who joins us from New York to um, I see um, 
Leonard Lerman, who joins us from Long Island, I believe. I see uh, all kinds of people there that I don't know where they're, they're, they're joining us from. But um, you're all welcome here. Unless you're nasty, then we will put you in the, in the penalty box. <laughs> we have, we have a, a technical director who also serves as referee and, and barroom bouncer, and his name is Charlie Welch. And we welcome you, Charlie Welch. Um, I want to announce a couple of things that are upcoming that we're very proud to be part of. Um, the July 4th anti-imperialist picnic is happening on, on the, um, in, in Alston at the Christian Herder Park, right next to the, uh, the, where, the, where you can rent a kayak. If you're from Boston, I'm sure you know the place. Join us for the anti-imperialist picnic on July 4th. Um, there's also uh, this Friday, um, which is June 25th, a concert that's sponsored by two co-sponsors. They're my favorites on the planet. One of them is called the Watertown El Salvador Sister City Committee, and the other is called the Community Church of Boston, and it's a benefit for both of them, and it will feature Dean Stevens. That would be yours truly, uh, and uh, special guest Teresa Tuduri, fabulous high priestess of, of song, joining us from Mesilla, New Mexico, very close to El Paso. Uh, I'm very much looking forward to that concert, and there will be more announcements about it as 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 the day approaches. Um, it's a benefit for for the church and for our Watertown El Salvador Sister City Committee. David Rovix, so I'm glad to have you again we'll <laughs> for uh, for another program. You just are so perfect for what we do, David, and, and it's just so great. And uh, I, I have uh, a rumor that you're going to be in town at the end of July, beginning of August, and I can hardly wait to coordinate a live concert in our auditorium, newly air-conditioned with highly efficient heat pumps just for your arrival. Brilliant. Um, Sounds great. Folks, welcome David Rovix. Thank you. I'm being told my internet is not unstable. That always happens every time I have a gig, uh, you know. But we'll see. Hopefully it, it stays stable enough for the song. Chevron came to Ecuador. It was Texaco back then. They did there what they did so many times again. An ocean of sludge stored in pits unwind. No stone unturned, no resources unmined. They called it the Chernobyl of the Amazon. A thousand square miles, dead and gone. When Chevron came to Ecuador, it was a dictatorship then. What happened in the Amazon, they didn't care. As long as they made money, let the oil flow. Where the waste went, no one wanted to know. And if they did, they could be bought. And if not, they could be abducted, tortured, and shot. When Chevron came to Ecuador, the location was preferred by the oil corporation. Because they had free reign, there was no oversight. And if anyone complained, then one night they'd not be seen again. It was a torture state. This was why Chevron thought it was so great. When Chevron came to Ecuador, it was paradise on earth. They turned it into a land of stillbirth. They left behind the ruins and took all the loot. Now they're trying to silence the ones who brought the lawsuit. Why was Danziger detained? A corrupt judge knows. And where are all the billions that the company owes? When Chevron came to Ecuador. When Chevron came to Ecuador. My goodness, David Rovix. A song for this moment 
when we get to hear from Stephen, you write that song. It's just um, give the man a topic and a deadline and you'll hear a little piece of genius. Thank you, David Rovix. That, that's just, I, I just can't believe it. Um, so I'd like to wish everybody a happy Juneteenth filled with peace and justice. Um, I want to read something that, that Mary Lynn Kramer sent me. I want to thank Mary Lynn, who's, who's with us this morning, for, uh, for really being on top of, of a whole lot of media um, and a whole lot of events and, uh, and sending them along to a, a bunch of us. If you'd like to be on, on Mary Lynn's list, um, you could be in touch with her or with me, and, and I will help you figure out how to be on there. It's, it's two or three things a day that she sends out, but this one about Juneteenth really, really strikes me, and it's uh, connected with a YouTube video about the same topic, which is uh, about the 13th Amendment, which supposedly abolished slavery. And it's celebrated for that. Um, and it was supposed to abolish involuntary servitude once and for all, but it didn't. To the surprise of many, the 13th Amendment includes an exception clause that makes slavery and involuntary servitude legal as punishment for crime. As a result, the racist legacy of slavery carried through black codes, Jim Crow laws, mass incarceration, and police brutality continues to threaten the lives of black people and other people of color. Today, more than 150 years later, after the passage of the 13th Amendment, people who are incarcerated and detained across our country are disproportionately black and brown, forced to work for private corporations, state-owned corporations, and correctional agencies, making an average of 86 cents per hour. In five states, incarcerated people earn nothing. It is estimated that 14 billion dollars is stolen in wages from incarcerated people every year. But worse yet, incarcerated people who refuse to work are often beaten, denied visits, calls, put in solitary confinement, and even denied parole. We must pass the abolition amendment, which reads, neither slavery nor involuntary, involuntary servitude may be, may be imposed as a punishment for a crime. To end the exception in the 13th Amendment, it's time to abolish slavery and involuntary servitude once and for all. Thank you, Mary Lynn. I would have uh, had you read it yourself if I would have thought of it, knowing that you're uh, such a faithful attendee to these Zoom meetings. And um, uh, so, so thanks, thanks for sending that along, Mary Lynn. And I'd be glad to forward it to anyone interested, be in touch with me. Um, so um, happy Juneteenth to all of you. And uh, thank you to Crystal Rollins Jackson, our uh, uh, treasure of a uh, office manager and graphic designer for putting together a beautiful banner that uh, was looking out our picture window as the enormous Juneteenth celebration was happening yesterday in Copley Square. So. Um, that's, um, uh, Crystal has done so much for us to, to beautify and edify our auditorium and our presence out on the sidewalk and in the windows. Um, I want to celebrate the end of our COVID season by looking back and urging you to look back and you don't have to just remember it. You can um, watch it. It's all on our YouTube channel. There's a whole bunch of stuff and it's all there. It's unedited, which means you can uh, skip all the boring Dean parts and go straight to the, the meat of the speaker or, or the musician. We've had a, a ton of wonderful musicians and um, uh, just check it out. You can listen to Daniel Ellsberg, who was with us in December to receive our annual Sacco and Vanzetti Award. 
Uh, that's kind of a long one. Uh, we let Daniel go on and on and on and on. It, it lasted about three hours plus, uh, and, and it was beautiful and, and, and lengthy. Um, and there is, uh, there is the most recent thing we did, which was confer the, the, this year's Sacco and Vanzetti Award to Julian Assange, uh, received by his father and brother. And that was last Wednesday. That is also on our YouTube channel. There is a memorial service for Bob D'Atilio, who is um, uh, probably the world's foremost scholar on uh, early 20th century anarchism and, and Sacco and Vanzetti, who are our sort of martyr patron saints. Um, his memorial service is on that YouTube channel. There's programs from Chris Hedges, which received about 35,000 views already. There's a program from uh, Richard Wolf, who was just so kind and gracious to, to give us um, a program and many others, many others. Check out our YouTube channel. Give us a like and subscribe to our YouTube channel as well. It's, it's our new little archival um, gem, although YouTube could change the, change the rules and, and um, render that moot anytime they wanted. Uh, so that's something for us to think of, about as we go about our archiving of our 50 years of, of cassettes uh, with wonderful stuff that we're going we're gonna to add and make available to you as well. I want to hear from folks uh, soon. Email me, dean at deanstevens.com. Ideas for programs for next fall or even for this summer. We can, we can keep on meeting virtually from wherever we are, from some island off the coast of Maine, from wherever you happen to be. We can, we can keep meeting on Sundays, and we will. But we will also take a break. It's time to, to rest a little bit. And I hope you folks get a chance to rest. I want to, I want to tell you about one more thing that happened this past Wednesday. It was a, uh, a luncheon and meeting to inaugurate our new heating and air conditioning system for three out of the five floors of our building. It was a, uh, an effort that it was uh, an, a year and four months in, in the making and it is finally complete and we are enjoying it and it's a super efficient system that is an incentive to complete our, our exercises in energy efficiency, which are many. It's an old leaky building, but we are uh, determined to continue our efforts. We also received during that luncheon an award from the Green Committee of the Neighborhood Association of the Back Bay. Um, uh, it was, it was conferred by uh, this uh, wonderful energizing, energizer bunny of an 85-year-old lady named Jacqueline Royce, who has just been a fire under our you-know-what to get ourselves in gear to, to find funding for some of these energy efficiency projects. Um, she has just been incredible. And uh, partly because of her, uh, we received this heating and air conditioning at a very reduced price and financing for what was left. Okay, so that's enough of me. And uh, I want to bring back David for a, a song. Are you, uh, are you there, David? Looks like Dev David has stepped away for a moment and he's allowed that because he's got two young kids and a family and um, keep your eye open for a David Rovix physical concert in our auditorium towards the end of July beginning of August um, so let's let's just go on straight to Stephen a lot of you know about Stephen his work and his harassment by, oh, we have David back. 
David, are you ready for uh, for a song? Or you want to do it later? Sorry, what, what was that? I just stepped David, in. David, <laughs> as, as you just noted, I was I was watching on YouTube. I didn't didn't realize I was uh, ready what, for uh, a song as a preface to Stephen's presentation. Oh sure, sure. Okay. I am happy to oblige. Okay, well, if the first song I did was specifically about Stephen, uh, this is uh, this is about somebody, uh, about people that far predate uh, any of us in this uh, room here. My name is John Riley. I'll have your ear only a while. I left my dear home in Ireland. It was death, starvation, or exile. When I got to America, it was my duty to go. Enter the army and slog across Texas to join in the war against Mexico. And it was there in the pueblos and hillsides that I saw the mistake I had made. Part of the conquering army with the morals of a bayonet blade. There amidst all these poor dying Catholics, screaming children, the burning stench of it all. Myself and 200 Irishmen decided to rise to the call. From Dublin City to San Diego, we witnessed freedom denied. So we formed the St. Patrick Battalion and we fought on the Mexican side. We formed the St. Patrick Battalion and we fought on the Mexican side. We marched beneath the green flag of St. Patrick, emblazoned with Erin Goldbra. Bright with the harp and the shamrock and the libertad para republica. Just 50 years after Wolf Tone, 5,000 miles away, the Yanks called us a legion of strangers, and they can talk as they may. But from Dublin City to San Diego, we witnessed freedom denied. So we formed the St. Patrick Battalion, and we fought on the Mexican side. We formed the St. Patrick Battalion, and we fought on the Mexican side. We fought them in five major battles. Churubusco was the last. Overwhelmed by the cannons from Boston, we fell after each mortar blast. Most of us died on that hillside at the service of the Mexican state. So far from our occupied homeland, we were heroes and victims of fate. From Dublin City to San Diego, we witnessed freedom denied. So we formed the St. Patrick Battalion and we fought on the Mexican side. From Dublin City to San Diego, we witnessed freedom denied. So we formed the St. Patrick Battalion and we fought on the Mexican side. We formed the St. Patrick Battalion and we fought on the Mexican side. Thank you, David. Thank you. It's a phenomenal song. As soon as I'm done here, I want to share it with with my hostess Rachel Macias, who's uh, Mexicana, and I've never I've never shared that with her. Uh, it reminds me of that beautiful CD that is on that theme. It's called San Patricio, and it's by um, Ry Cooter and the Chieftains, and it's just this beautiful melding of of Mexican traditional music with Irish traditional music. Uh, that's one of my favorite uh, records on the planet. Uh, the Chieftains and Rai Cooter San Patricio talking about the St. Patrick's Brigade. Um, let's welcome attorney Stephen Donziger. 
I don't think I have to introduce him. I, I just want to say that it's just really an honor and a privilege, privilege to to have you with us to close out the season. And we're looking forward to hearing more from you about your situation, about your case, and how most of all we can be helpful to to you and to the people of uh, of the Amazon of Ecuador. Stephen Donziger. <laughs> Well, thank you so much. Are me okay? Yeah, we we're hearing you. Go okay. ahead, Stephen. Yeah. For, uh, Dean, thank you for the history of your church, the important work you have been doing for decades. Um, it's a high honor to be asked to follow in this tradition by sharing my story with you. So thank you for that. And, and I want to say to David, your song, uh, your songs are fabulous. Your first song, I, I got to figure out a way to get a hold of that, and put it on my Twitter feed, but we'll do that. We'll talk about that after. Um, just thank you so much for taking the time to write that and put it together. Um, I'm going to talk just for a few minutes um, and open it up for any questions and discussion. Um, my fundamental point uh, about my story is, well, there's a couple of points. One is my story really is about people in Ecuador. It's not about me. I mean, it concerns me, but it's ultimately about indigenous peoples in the Amazon who are the frontline guardians of our planet, who are the people that take care of all of us. And I can say as a North American and a white man who lives in New York, I didn't really understand how that role functioned in our world until I started to spend a lot of time in the Amazon in Ecuador. I've been there over 250 times from my home in New York, if you can believe it. I'm working on this, this litigation and the broader struggle for justice. And the other thing I want to say, the other main point is what Chevron and the, these particular judges in Manhattan are trying to do to me personally is not only a threat to the survival of indigenous peoples in Ecuador, but also a threat to our entire society and everyone who speaks out about social justice, particularly those who take on corporations that harm people like Chevron has done. So those are the two main points. My particular story is I've been under house arrest now in Manhattan. I live in a two bedroom apartment with my wife and 14 year old son, Matthew. My wife's name is Laura Miller. Um, and I've been under house arrest now for 23 months with an ankle bracelet that's tied or shackled to my left lower left leg 24 seven. I sleep with it, I bathe with it, I eat with it, it never comes off. And it monitors my whereabouts, even around my own apartment, around my own apartment building. And the way that happen is very scary and I think fundamentally corrupt, which is basically after we won the case in Ecuador in 2013, it was, it was affirmed on appeal by Ecuador's highest court, their Supreme Court. Chevron started to turn the tables on me and they paid an Ecuadorian man, $2 million to come up here to the US and they sued me under the federal racketeering statute. It's a civil statute. They, they tried to get me prosecuted. The US attorney refused to prosecute me, appropriately refused to prosecute me. And they then just did it themselves with this judge who helped them, Lou Kaplan. And they paid a witness to come into Kaplan's court. He had denied me a jury. 
And this witness, this Ecuadorian man to whom they paid $2 million, claimed I was in a meeting where I bribed a judge in Ecuador. It was totally false. I sat there in court stupefied. I'm like, fuck, they're framing me. And I knew they'd get away with it because the judge was totally on their side. He's a former tobacco industry lawyer. So the judge ruled that I committed fraud in Ecuador. He stripped me of my ability to earn my legal fee from the case. But we were able to continue on behalf of the Ecuadorian communities litigating against Chevron's assets in Canada and other countries to force them to comply with the judgment. And we started to achieve a great deal of success, particularly in Canada, where the Supreme Court of Canada ruled in 2015, ruled unanimously that the people of Ecuador had a right to enforce their judgment in Canadian courts. It's a monumental human rights victory for the world, not to mention for my clients in Ecuador. After that happened, Chevron went after me again before Kaplan claiming they got Kaplan to impose literally millions of dollars of cost orders on me to pay their legal fees for this sham attack on me. That essentially bankrupted me. They took whatever money I had left. I'm a human rights lawyer, so it's not a lot of money, but it, it was my savings after a year of, excuse me, almost a lifetime of professional work. And they froze my bank accounts and took all my money. Subsequent to that, um, put that in Jamaica. So, um, so they they had taken my money. on the theory that they could somehow find hidden accounts that they thought they didn't think. I mean, they knew I didn't have it. This was all just a pretext to get my computer so they could see what we were doing in terms of enforcing the judgment in Canada and my conversations with lawyers, et cetera. Kaplan had already ruled that I had no privileges. I was basically a walking nullity as a lawyer, as regards to the U.S. Constitution. I refused to give them my computer on grounds of principle. I Instead, I appealed the order. And while the order was on appeal, Kaplan charged me with criminal contempt of court for refusing to give my computer over while I was contesting the lawfulness of his order. Which, by the way, I later found out had never happened before in the history of the United States. That is, a lawyer appealing a discovery order, which is what this was, had never been charged with criminal contempt of court which, by the way, is a misdemeanor charge. Um, and then when I went in to contest this charge, Kaplan had locked, he had me locked up in my home. And I am now the only person in the United States of America charged with a federal misdemeanor who's locked up in his home pretrial. The maximum sentence I could get if convicted, and I'm innocent, but they will convict me because it's a ben another bench trial without a jury, is six months in prison. And I've already been in my home almost two years. Two other features of this incredible story that I think really are highly relevant. One, Kaplan took his charges to the U.S. Attorney's Office to prosecute me. 
at this contempt charge and they refused to prosecute me again for the second time. Kaplan then appointed a private law firm to prosecute me. The law firm is called Seward and Kissel and they failed to disclose and Kaplan failed to disclose that Chevron is a client of this private law firm, some being prosecuted for all intents and purposes by Chevron. This is the first corporate prosecution in U.S. history. The other thing he did is rather than let the case be randomly assigned to a judge as is required for criminal cases in New York and all over the federal system, he appointed a good friend of his, Loretta Preska, who's a prominent member of the Federalist Society, which is a right-wing legal group that, among other things, tries to control the federal judiciary. And she um, makes speeches all the time for the Federalist Society. And I found out that Chevron, none other than Chevron, is a major funder of the Federalist Society. So my prosecutor works for a Chevron law firm. And my judge is a prominent leader of a Chevron-funded organization. Kaplan, who charged me, former tobacco lawyer, um, also has investments in Chevron according to his financial disclosure forms. I'm surrounded by Chevron in this ridiculous case that's led to my detention. I believe this is a new corporate playbook invented by Chevron and really adopted by the fossil fuel industry generally to go after critics like me. So here I am. Now, it obviously is not easy to live in your house for two years. They took my passport. Um, I cannot travel to see my clients. I cannot travel to Canada to work with lawyers. The case, to some degree, has been stalled as a result of my detention. Um, but, you know, we're, meaning me and my family are good in the sense that we try to create happiness every day in our home and we are, we are trying our best to sort of stay strong and we're I think succeeding to some degree because we are building a much bigger movement as people rally to the cause of the Ecuadorians and to me as their lawyer. Um, so I'm going to stop there and open it up and see if people have anything to say, but I, I just thank you again for the opportunity to share my story. By the way, we have a website if you want to help and where you can learn more about the case. It's called donzigerdefense.com, one word. We have a um, legal defense fund, which is held in trust by a uh, law firm in Seattle that's been helping me for a number of years. And you can, if you wanna, one of our main needs, honestly, is money. I mean, fighting this monster is not easy. And the only way we can do it and pay lawyers and pay our expenses is to um, raise a lot of small, you know, a high quantity of small volume donations. Um, so no matter if you're inclined to help, please try to give a little bit of something and hopefully that'll help get us to where we need to go. So I'll stop there. Thank you so much. Stephen, thank you. Thank you for the work you have done. And thank you for the victory that we hope you will achieve for the sake of, of the, 
th justice in this country. Um, generally, we um, have a, a song here during which we make uh, a money pitch. What I want to do is, is tell folks that um, there is an honorarium Stephen will receive that will go straight to that Donziger defense. Um, and, and also encourage you all to uh, go to that same website. It's called www.donzigerdefense.com and donate generally, generously. Um, this, is, this is just such an incredible, baffling case to all of us. Um, so that's that's our money pitch, and it's it's not for us. It's it's to Stephen uh, on this occasion that we're just so honored that you joined us. And David Rovix, take us out with with another song, will you? And then we'll have a a lengthy question and answer. Very happily. And. Uh... And for what it's worth, I would sure love to be involved with any fundraising efforts uh, if they involve uh, concerts uh, or anything else I can do to get the word out. Uh, it's a great website, the Donziger Defense website. That's where I collected all my information for the song. And it's also very gratifying to see that... Uh, Stephen's got a lot of followers on Twitter. There's actually people paying attention out there. And uh, here's a here's a fundraising pitch song. The death toll keeps mounting. Each time I turn on my phone, another mass shooting, another free fire zone. Failed states of America, white supremacist rule, society riven with victims and tools. The fires keep burning, completely out of control. Makes you miss the old days of the ozone hole. The snow is all melting. The lakes of Greenland, the best hope that I have, I hold in my hand. If there's a tomorrow, then when yesterday's through, you have me, and I have you. We might have to leave town. Or maybe we'll fall beneath the hail of bullets at the shopping mall. Perhaps we'll be arrested. Perhaps they'll pass us by. But wherever we might be, when we look up at the sky, if there's a tomorrow, then when yesterday's through, you have me, and I have you. They can call it natural, made by humankind. We'd like it to be different. This is the place we find The one we inherit The one we're in now Whatever might come of the future Why, when, how If there's a tomorrow Then when yesterday's through You have me And I have you if there's a tomorrow, then when yesterday's through, you have me, and I have you, I have you. 
Thank you, David. Thank you. Thank you, David. Inspiring. Stephen, I want to open with, with a question. I've, I've watched uh, a lot of your interviews on uh, left media, um, little YouTube hosts of this kind and that kind. Democracy Now! was probably the, the most prominent one, but you've been pretty much, it seems, ignored by mainstream media and uh, obvious reasons, you know, corporate owned, uh, um, oil company controlled. But uh, I wonder if you'd just comment on that. Have you made any attempt to get major networks or, or, um, or to, to cover you or interview you, or uh, have they just willfully and ignored you? That's a great question. I've made tons of attempts. They've totally ignored me. They can't cover this story. I mean, let me rephrase. Of course they can cover the story. Um, they have a hard time with this story. I mean, there's a couple of main reasons. Chevron's a major advertiser. Chevron is super alert to trying to kill stories about me. They have a, like kind of a legal goon squad that, con you know, when a reporter contacts them for comment, they you know, engage in all sorts of nefarious activities to get them to just not run the story. You know, they'll send them Kaplan's decision. They'll threaten them with a lawsuit. They'll threaten them with pulling out ad a, a revenue. So the corporate owned media, meaning, you know, the New York Times, CNN, the, net, the TV networks have just totally ignored the story. We pitched them all. Um, two or three of them have actually done stories that got killed. They never made it to air. Um, the New York Times assigned a very prominent reporter. He was working on it for two weeks um, and ultimately called me and said they spiked the story. Turns out with the New York Times that Ted Boutros Jr., who's one of Chevron's main lawyers attacking me, is there also as a lawyer for the New York Times, Gibson, Dunn, and Crutcher Law Firm. So there's a total conflict of interest. I put this on my Twitter feed. New York Times is really a very weak institution. It's gotten weaker, you know, in recent years. And I, it's, a, to me, a total act of cowardice. They won't come talk to me. What I predict they're going to do, by the way, is they're going to um, do a story when I, I'm found guilty of my criminal contempt case. You know, they're going to they're going to ignore me for two years This massive human rights violation, 30 minute walk from their newsroom. And then they're going to do a story when Judge Preska, Kaplan's friend, finds me guilty. You know, I, I it's just unfortunate, but, uh, you know, we don't really have free press in our society, as most of you, I'm sure, know. Yeah, um, uh, I have other questions, but I, a lot of other people want to want to comment and, and ask. Um, Alan Clemens is joining us by phone from up uh, northern northern Maine. Alan, are you there? Oh, yeah. Listen, let me. I'm gonna get come back in about ten minutes. Okay. 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 Um, all right, so let's go to the to some things in the in the chat. Um, uh, so um, let me while I'm looking at the chat, let me ask you, Stephen. I have never heard of a private prosecution. Um, that is such a bizarre phenomenon. Uh, uh, I asked uh, another person who's on this call is named Emily Yozel. She's an attorney, a friend of mine, lives in Costa Rica and was involved in your case earlier on. She talked about uh, occasionally this happening 
in in the U.S. But can you explain what a private prosecution is and and how it's been used in the past? Yeah, I can. It's it's extraordinarily rare. I mean, we don't prosecute people in America or in any rule of law country privately. Okay, it just doesn't happen. There is this rule uh, in the federal rules of criminal procedure called Rule 42, which allows a judge um, to appoint a private prosecutor under some extremely limited circumstances. Um, and it usually has to do with some sort of conflict of interest with the local prosecutor, et cetera. Maybe it's happened a half dozen times in our country in the last 30 years. And each time it's happened, the judge who appoints the prosecutor stays out of it. And the prosecutor, who's just an individual, former, federal, almost always a formal, former federal prosecutor, who's now doing in private practice, um, is supervised by the Department of Justice. That is, they adhere to DOJ guidelines with ethics and that kind of thing, which are very high. I mean, no matter what you think of our criminal justice system, and obviously there's a whole host of problems, like most prosecutors who work in the federal system try to adhere to their ethical guidelines, even if their choices of who to prosecute are completely structurally tainted by racism and other factors. But, you know, in this case, um, that extraordinarily rare, rare procedure is being totally abused because Kaplan has appointed a flagrantly conflicted prosecutor who does not answer to the DOJ. She answers to him. Under our Constitution, apologies, this is a little technical, but it's worth mentioning. Under our Constitution, we have something called separation of powers, meaning different branches of government are responsible for doing different things, you know. There's the executive branch, the president, the legislative branch, the Congress, the judicial branch, the courts, okay? In our society, the executive branch prosecutes crime, meaning the president appoints the U.S. attorney whose office decides what to prosecute, what not to prosecute. Judges do not prosecute crime in America. And what Kaplan's done is he has taken control of the prosecution where he's the prosecutor. In other words, the very person who charged me with criminal contempt of court is basically controlling my prosecution by appointing the lawyer who's a Chevron lawyer and appointing the judge who's a Chevron link judge. And it's just illegal. It's unconstitutional. Now, the next question is, well, if it's so illegal, why, why is, how can it happen? Well, a lot of illegal things happen in our courts. Okay, people need to just understand that. You know, and what they're doing is, is making it happen. It's not being stopped by the Second Circuit Court of Appeals, the Federal Court of Appeals. I've asked them to stop it. They've ignored it. They're protecting Kaplan. Ultimately, because I don't have a jury, I'm gonna get convicted on these bogus charges and they will try to put me in jail. I am going to appeal and ultimately will appeal if I need to, to the Supreme court of the United States. And that process could take two to four, three, four years after, you know, and by the time it, any case that might be heard is really heard and decided it's likely I will have served my entire sentence. So even if I'm, even if it's reversed and I'm found to be innocent, it'll be too late. And that's the trick that Kaplan is playing on me right now. He knows that. He knows how the system works. I mean, I do too. And ultimately, he's using this private prosecution mechanism illegally. By the way, I, that's not just my opinion. There's so many legal experts who agree with my assessment of that. I mean, prominent professors, academics who've never seen this craziness. And, but they're getting away with it. It's, it's really 
a violation of the rule of law. And, and frankly, if this were happening in another country like Turkey or Saudi Arabia, our State Department would be all over it. Condemning it. You know, here in the United States, they don't say a damn thing. In the in the Assange situation, um, we are we are being asked to to call the Justice Department and write letters to Merrick Garland. Um, is is there any sort of recourse there, Stephen? Hello. Sorry, I went on mute. In the Assange situation, his goal, as I understand it, is to get the Justice Department to not extradite him or to drop charges so he does not get extradited. Okay. And I support that. In my situation, we have written Merrick Garland demanding that the DOJ intervene and take back my prosecution from the private Chevron law firm. I'm probably the only lawyer in the history of the United States who is begging, begging the Department of Justice to prosecute him or her. What I would give for a professional, non-conflicted prosecutor, even on a bogus case, I'd give my life for that. Like a prosecutor, like, like, you know. And remember, the DOJ turned down this case to begin with. And Kaplan tricked it up by appointing the private law firm. So obviously, if they take it back, they're going to dismiss the charges. And I'm going to be free. But Merrick Garland is an extreme, in my view, is an extremely passive person um, but we are demanding Garland take back the prosecution and stop it immediately um, and by the way I think on my website there's a way to sign a petition to that effect so we see that place yes yes yeah. it's it's right there the petition um, uh, let's see Charlie, I am not able to scroll through with if if this is if you're sharing this, see if there's any any anybody with their hand up. If you'd like to put a hand up and and uh, and uh, have a question for for Stephen, um, uh, go ahead now. There there it is. Now I I can see everybody. Ken, go ahead. Ken, unmute yourself. Uh, yeah, hi. Um, thank you for your work and your struggle. Um, I just wondered if you could tell us a bit more about the situation that led to your um, your incarceration. You know, what's happening in Ecuador, what the struggle is there, what you've done a little bit, um, a little bit more um, about that situation, if you could. Sure, thank you for that. I. I I hate not focusing on that. So I really appreciate that. Refocusing this talk on what is the most important thing. So basically, you know, the people of Ecuador who live in this area where Texaco operated for roughly 30 years are really suffering. Um, I would call it a slow mass murder. There's literally thousands of people have died of cancer with no medical treatment because Chevron... Texaco, now Chevron, essentially engaged for profit in a mass industrial poisoning of a 1,500 square mile area of the Amazon. And, you know, the indigenous peoples there had lived for millennia in relative abundance, prosperity, with no money. I mean, you know it's possible to be rich and not have money in that kind of culture. You know, they were rich and they had no money. They didn't need money, as we understand money. They had everything they needed in the forest, in the natural ecosystem. And in a few short years, Texaco ruined it, stole it, 
just to save three bucks a barrel. My last trip down there, you know, I visit the communities and, oh, it's very emotional, you know, and it's, it's, it's emotional to be a lawyer who has fought so hard and you just look at the people you're trying to help and you realize you haven't delivered a single concrete material benefit to your clients. In 28 years of work, not a single concrete material benefit has been delivered to my clients in Ecuador in 28 years of work. And to the contrary, I would say hundreds and maybe thousands of people have died of cancer. And you don't really know the number because there's no database. People die anonymously. They die without treatment. They die in the forest because of exposures to this pollution that Chevron left and refuses to clean up. So people are really hurting and the attacks on me are obviously attacks on the people of Ecuador ultimately and primarily. So, you know, the good part is there are other lawyers besides me working on this in Canada and elsewhere who are trying to help the communities enforce their judgment against Chevron. Um, so even if I don't extricate myself from this situation anytime soon, there's other possibilities for them. But, you know, the, the unfortunate sad truth is I think my energy, my vision, my ten tenacity, my drive, my skill has to a great a, to a great degree kept this thing moving for so many years. And, you know, so being locked up obviously doesn't help the matter. Alan, if that makes any sense, yeah. Yeah. Alan, are you ready? Go ahead. You need to unmute. How's that? All right. All right. Can, go ahead. Yes. Go ahead, Alan. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, I'm a little scattered today. I'm on my way to a memorial gathering, and uh, so I was on the phone before. Uh, Stephen, thank you for joining us. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's an honor, an immense honor. And, um, you know, I've, I've heard you on Ralph Nader's show, and I think I heard one of your attorneys on uh, Law and Disorder. So I, I, I have a kind of an understanding of the legal quagmire you're in. And um, uh, one thing I wanted to do was I'm a, I'm a member of the congregation, and um, I just wanted to share with everyone, uh, like, my experience in Ecuador. And um, I wanted to just talk a little bit about Ecuador partly because it's so far away in this 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 environmental travesty this this incredible uh, uh just a just a travesty pollution uh you know we know when bp pollutes the gulf of mexico or exxon pollutes the prince william sound in alaska that's a lot closer to home people are able not everyone's involved against it or or advocating for the right thing but at least they know where it is and it's a, it's a lot more real to people and I think the, the oil companies are more responsive slightly uh, because it's potentially much closer to home. Um, so I just want to talk about Ecuador just for a second. And um, so Ecuador is sits on the equator, of course, on the west coast of South America. It's about the size of Nevada, state of Nevada. And right down the middle of it runs the Andes Mountains. So to the west of the Pacific coast, you've got a, a very tropical, very hot climate down near the coast and and there's of course there's transition between the mountains and the coast and then on the east coast on the east side of the andes mountains it it, it descends into the amazon forest uh mostly bordering with peru uh, i get i think in the north up where the, that oil region is your, that we're dealing with here today i think that some of that might actually the rivers might actually run into colombia i'm not sure but um but anyway, it's it's a fascinating area, and I've been there, and uh, I was there in 1996, and um, it's 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 so interesting. I, I was I was into I went down down river into the forest into the rainforest, and it's it's just so fascinating because what happens is is as you come down from the Andes Mountains and you get into the 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 rainforest, there's there's a transition area of kind of scrubby. 
low. Uh, it's not really jungle yet, but it's um, it's it's getting there. It's you know it's on the equator, so it's still uh, tropical. And as you go down the rivers, the rivers get bigger, and that's kind of the opposite of what we how we picture things. I think often where you go up river, it gets more remote and away from civilization and so on. In in Ecuador, it's the opposite. As you go down river. Uh, the rivers broaden out incredibly, and the rivers are the highways. And um, indigenous folks and everybody, you know, kind of um, gets around on dugout canoes from the magnificent, huge trees found in the forest. And um, so they're the highways, and they're, they're motorized. And so I, I went down probably pretty close to the Peru border. I'm not sure how far down it, it was. Um, but anyway, um, I was a guest of a nonprofit NGO and um, that, that works with the native folks. And, and the, the folks, the native folks there are just extraordinary. And, I, and Stephen, you know, you mentioned the beauty of those people. And, and, and it's just so true. They, you know, they, they just want to live their life. Uh, they've had this inflicted upon them. And it, it, it is very much as you started off the talk today, talking about it's an attack on the whole planet. The, the tactics of Chevron and big oil are, are, it's not just the rainforest, it's not just the Amazon rainforest, it's, it's the planet and it's their approach to it. Um, so also, you know, as I mentioned about the, the other big oil spills that we know about in North America, you know, lately all the, the water protectors efforts in the headwaters of the Mississippi and the Missouri River watersheds also, it, it's very similar. In some, it has similarities to this, uh, this, this travesty. That uh, you know, this is the these are the headwaters of the Amazon River, and and that all that oil has nowhere to go but downriver, and um, it, it's just it's just so awful that way. So I wanted to you know bring Ecuador a little bit closer to home for our community, and um, it you know I encourage anyone to go to Ecuador. It's this fairly compact country that has these different bioregions, it's just fascinating. I urge people not to go to the Galapagos. They don't need you there. I didn't go. I'll leave it for the scientists and whatever. But um, anyway, um, Stephen, to you, I want to I want to wish you a happy Father's Day. And uh, I want I hope your son knows what a hero you are. I'm sure he does every day. I'm sure he does. But but let's say it out loud and into your wife. You know, I, I I would like her to know that that we support you and your family, and as lonely and as isolated as it might feel sometime, you know, we're we're with you all the time, and um, and and the people in Ecuador are with you, and it's it's, you know, let's let's turn all this into a, a a positive. Let's be stronger, and let's work against Chevron, let's boycott, let's let's work with the people working on divestiture. Say divest from Chevron first. You know, give them a try and see how it goes, and then go we'll go move on to Exxon and, and all the others. You know, so anyway, thank you for bearing with me, and um, really thank you again, Stephen, for sharing with us today. Can you I'm, guys hear me? Yes. I'm going back on my phone. <laughs> okay. Um, Alan, thank you for those kind words, and uh, you know, I'll reiterate what Alan said about Ecuador. It's a beautiful country. Um. You know, it's an interesting place to visit. Uh, and a lot of people, by the way, visit the affected area where I do my work um, and they take what's called taxi tours where the, you know, some of the local leaders will take people around and, you know, for a day and you can see some of these polluted sites and they explain what actually happened. And it's, it's really unbelievable to see it. I mean, you know, it's been out there five decades. It's still there. I mean, you just you just cannot believe it's all visible to the naked eye. Still, these lakes and lakes of oil on in the on the floor of the rainforest. I mean, who would do that? I mean, it's almost like I, I still have a hard time getting my arms around around the people that that people in Texaco made the decision to do it this way. I, I just can't believe it. But, you know, my first trip there in 90, 1993, it, it moved me greatly. And I obviously wasn't able to turn my back on it. And here I am. Yeah. 
Dan Kontoff, you have your hand up. Go ahead and unmute yourself. Hi, Dan. Okay. <clears throat> Good morning. Good morning. Um, I have to wake up. I did an uh, event yesterday called um, Teen, Juneteenth, Juneteenth events. Yeah. And the heat. And the heat is not bad in Boston because we don't have climate change here yet. We can be in denial. That's the problem about Boston. Our TV news media uh, for, the, for the weather people, they don't talk about climate destruction. They avoid it. So it is a problem. I just call it a couple of things that there's a maybe a vegan restaurant might want to put up a thing downstairs uh, to help you fundraise. They're you know a local chain and they part of, they pay rent to the community church and maybe they, Dean you could ask them yeah. idea for that for a pitch. My, my sense Dan is is they pro besides the vegan thing they try to steer clear of, of all things political and they have made that pretty yeah. clear to us regarding our sandwich boards and whatnot. Okay, and the other thing is, um, the sad part about corporate media, there's a major people getting arrested right now in a big pipeline in the Midwest, I forget what state it is. I think one day it was almost a thousand and no corporate media on that at all. So we have a problem in the country, who owns the media? And the majority of people in Boston said, say, watch corporate media, they won't listen to the underground. We have the Juneteenth rally at Yes and Copley. How many people stop to see it or go to the art instead? Of the other vendors at the other event. The problem is apathy. It's the biggest disease in America. Why do I have to in places like Boston with a lot of money? We can close your eyes and go out and live a luxurious lifestyle where not everybody in Boston has that. That's not really, it's, there's two worlds here in Boston, like most cities. There's the poor working class and those who have the money. And the young people, a lot of them go to college here, come from money. So we have major problems like any city. But, uh, I just want to point out those points that uh, I'm always pushing corporate media to cover stories. I call them up when I see something going on in Boston politically, and sometimes we get lucky. <laughs> All right, I'm done. Thanks, Dan. Um, I see Kevin's hand up. Go ahead, Kevin. Yeah, uh, yeah, this, yeah, it's Kevin Devine. Uh, Braintree. Uh, I see. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to just going to say. Uh, uh, well, it's just that I'm just wondering because if the problem, you know, you, you, you know, you, we, you, the, you, it sounds like you've been set up by this um, political le uh, legislative uh, arrangement. Um, but, it, I, but it seems like you, you know, you, you're talking that you, I've heard this conversation about uh, going to the Attorney General uh, uh, Merrick Garland to address your issues. Uh, the issues of, of what's going on uh, here in the United States. Uh, but uh, is anything being done, say, to uh, address these issues of, of the environment uh, and, and the use of oil and uh, by, the, by, by the Oil and Chemical and Atomic Workers Union in Texas? Uh, just to, you know, just... In, in, in terms of uh, civil disobedience, maybe staging protests uh, against in your situation. Uh, it, um, so I'll just leave it like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I, I'm not familiar with anything, you know, with the union or whatever. I mean, there's, there's a, look, there's a broad global movement to basically eliminate or phase out the fossil fuel industry you know because without doing that we're not going to have a planet as we know it in even a few years so you know i've called for the u.s government to nationalize the fossil fuel industry and phase it out it's such a destructive industry i mean what chevron is doing to the people of ecuador and to me is an example of that but it's one of many many examples of you know this basically intimidation campaign designed to get people to lay off while they extract every last dollar of profit they can while the planet gets destroyed. You know, so people are waking up. I mean, the support we've gotten in, in this particular case has been amazing. You know, I've, I've got over 70,000 Twitter followers now just in like the last year. Um, people are really engaged with this story. And we're making pro we're making really good progress. 
So, um, but we need more support. And I'm sure all of y'all are engaged as you are in the ways that you can be, but you know, we need this, this movement needs significant support. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Stephen, um, just wanted to ask you about the, 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 the um, Ecuador's, Ecuador's decision against Chevron and whether they will have any way to collect on that money to clean, clean up the Amazon or if, or if Chevron can just ignore it. Um, and the other thing is, is it a, a matter of, of the politics of the situation? I know that it's gone back and forth in Ecuador between left and right. And, uh, and there was a certain Rafael Correa who was, who was uh, really just the, that magnificent way that they changed the constitution during his administration that gave legal rights to nature, which was a phenomenal thing. Uh, but then, then it changed over. And so how does that fit in with, with your case? And is there any chance that Ecuador will receive this, the, this money? Well, um, you know, the, the legal case and the, the judgment, and let me be clear, the people of Ecuador won the case. Our side won the case. It's been affirmed on appeal um, by Ecuador's highest court. So don't let Chevron convince you that they've won. They have not. We've won. And the reason they're doing this to me is precisely because we won. Um, and I want to just be real clear about that. Yes, this judgment can be enforced uh, successfully in other countries against their assets. And I am confident that at some point it will be. Um, it requires lawyers and resources to do that. And... You know, it's always a struggle, but there are lawyers helping and we hope to get there at some point. So it's important to know this case is still very much alive from the standpoint of collecting on the judgment. I mean, this is why Chevron is attacking because they feel so, so much risk from this judgment. You know, and there's less risk if the main lawyer is locked up. Yeah, wow. Um... I see a hand from Faye Strigler. Welcome, Faye. Um, unmute and, and join us in the conversation. Okay. Uh, oh, what an honor to have you here, uh, uh, Stephen Donziger, and happy Father's Day. I, um, I, I'm just uh, thinking about all these uh, things that we could do to help. Uh, one thing is, um, you know, uh, details of, of boycotting Chevron. I know they have a, a refine, Chevron has a refinery in Richmond, California, doesn't it? Uh, where, where people are uh, fighting against, um, you know, the consequences of that. And the other thing is, um, yeah, and I'm just wondering if we can um, have a petition to uh, disbar uh, this judge. Uh, I was struck by the fact that he's recycled from um, all the people that supported tobacco interests. And uh, there was a big, uh, Naomi Arrestus um, had uh, written- My car, a book I want to after I talk to him. What? Where? Where is he? Uh, okay, Where is he? okay. Is he? Naomi, Naomi Arrestus had written a book called Merchants of Doubt about scientists, two scientists, uh, well, so-called scientists. They had all the credentials, but they were basically bought and paid for by the tobacco industry. And she wrote uh, a book about that whole thing um, and, and made a documentary about it called Merchants of Doubt. And um, it seems like these people are still being recycled, um, you know, like this uh, Judge Kaplan and I was wondering if, if is, um, can we have a petition to disbar this man? Because he shouldn't be a judge, obviously. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm just thinking about all the, all the things that, that we, could, we could do to help out to uh, expand the opposition, uh, what's happening to you. 
So, uh, are, 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 Oh, can you hear me or no? There? I can hear you. Um, oh, okay, I'm just wondering uh, about what can this barring this you? judge. You know, you guys ought to talk to lawyers about that. I mean, it's just very hard to get rid of a federal judge in America. I don't want to be Nelly negative about it, but you know, there's one way to get rid of a judge. It's called impeachment. It's happened four times in our history. So he's he's calculated he can get away with this. I do think though a public movement to get him impeached or get him to resign would be helpful to me and the Ecuadorians. Because you know, you don't need to say, oh, it'll work. I mean, the very fact that it's happening can help in many ways. Even if it doesn't get rid of him. So yes, you should do that if you can. Okay, well, one of those scientists that I talked about um, that was uh, bought and paid for by the tobacco industry died um, a year ago and nobody paid attention. I noticed because there was a small article in the, uh, you know, there was a small blurb on the news somewhere, but so listen, nobody um, noticed his, that he yeah. died, you know, because nobody cared about him basically. <laughs> Yeah. He, was, uh, so, um, he was a worthless human being as far as I'm concerned. Can you guys, can you guys hear me? Yes, we're hearing you, Stephen. Okay, I, I don't know if there's more questions. I can't really see, but I, I unfortunately am running out of my own time at this point. Um, is there, are there any in particular things you want to know before I have to go? I you, just wanted to express... You your appeal to the Supreme Court. Can you say, sue for damages? I can sue for whatever I want, but it usually will end up back before the same Federalist Society judges who are going to torment me, you know, so. I wish we could see you, Stephen. Well, it's, it's the whole, whole you got to understand, the whole system is very much structurally biased against those who do human rights work, you know, so. When you say sue, I mean, the presumption is it's a fair system. And if it, if it was fair, that kind of lawsuit would be viable. I'm not so sure that's the case here. Well, Stephen, I just want to conclude by thanking you for your, the generosity of, of the time that you've given us today to understand not only your case, but uh, uh, this, this like, I, I see it as the the last dying cries of a dying industry that that is... Uh, on its death knell and um well I, I i appreciate you saying that and I, I really do need to run but i'll just say a lot of people die in last the last days of a war so and i don't mean to i'm not dying but we're hurting so you know just remember that i agree with you the correlation of forces favors us and the people of ecuador i think we need to protect those who are in harm's way. And to the extent, I just want to repeat the website, donzigerdefense.com. Yeah. By the way, um, it, obviously, if you can give, please do. If you can't go there anyway, you can join, you can sign up for the campaign, give us your email, and you'll get regular case updates. All right, Stephen. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for joining us. And we hope to receive you physically here in Boston and put together a, a wonderful event for you. Uh, let's say on the other side of this, when you have achieved a, a victory in your appeal and we would co-sponsor it like with the ACLU and the National Lawyers Guild and Mass Peace Action and some environmental organizations. Yeah, I can already yeah. see it as a, just a really wonderful uh, reprieve for, for you. Um, I think we should let you go, Stephen. And, and again, thanks for this incredible program about an, this incredible injustice being done to you. And we will, we will be in touch with you and, and, and stay on top of your case and do anything we can do to help you in, in the near future and, and, and beyond. Thank you so much. I love you guys. I really appreciate the support. We love you too. Okay, take care. Folks, this is this has been a magnificent way to to end 
our season. I urge you to keep in touch, to come up with ideas for more programs during the summer and beyond. Uh, we're going to be taking a little rest. We have a, uh, an annual meeting that usually happens now in June. We've decided to, to put it into the fall so we can really have a, a physical meeting as, as well as a virtual meeting, which, which will be part of, of what we do from now on. And um, that's it. I hope you enjoy the summer. Be in touch. Maybe we'll see you at the anti-imperialist picnic on July 4th. There's going to be information about it on, on our Facebook page. We, we are co-sponsors and, uh, and there's an open mic for you to get up there and, and read or sing or, 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 or say your soapbox piece. Um, Dean, but, Dean I, tr I tried to access that and the link didn't work. Where is this uh, picnic? It's at Christian Herder Park in Alston which is uh, right uh, across the river from, from Harvard, sort Harvard. of, in a way. And, and will, will, virtual, a will, virtual way? Pre will virtual participation be possible? I don't know. We, we'll have to set up a, it's an outdoor thing. I don't know if there's any Wi-Fi that we can uh, get strong enough to do a Zoom link from there. Maybe with, with a hotspot uh, or something like that. WBZ is right across the street. Maybe they, they could help us cover it. I don't think they'd want to cover it, though. They're, they're probably oil company owned commercial uh, <laughs> TV station. But anyway, um, I want to thank you all for joining us. Leonard, Kevin, Faye, Dan, David Rovix, your music inspires me every day. And uh, check out some of the songs that, that David put up on, on the chat. Um, about Donziger, about the St. Patrick's Battalion and beyond. Jim Kasteris, thanks for joining us. Ken Casanova, Charlie, our, our co-host and our uh, production manager and president Poobah of, of, uh, of, of every realm. Barry Warner, Mary Lynn, Joan. Joan, thank you for joining us. Thank you for your commentaries on the chat. Cornelia Sullivan, I don't know you, but I'm glad to meet you and join us again soon. Alvin Foster, Christine Fogler, if any of you want to be on our mailing list, send an email to info at communitychurchofboston.org and we will add you to our mailing list and keep you abreast of stuff coming up this summer as well as into the fall. There's a Dean Stevens concert this Friday. Uh, you can find out about it on our, on our, on our website. And you can either buy a ticket or you can watch it for free on the YouTube channel, which is our Community Church of Boston official. That's what our YouTube channel is called, where you can also see a bunch of great programs from the past year. And you can skip the, the boring Dean parts. Um, this has been a lot of fun and a lot of information and just a, a great way to end our season. Anybody else, any last comments before we say amen and get out of here? Leonard, Thank once again, he has his hand up. Uh, two, two things uh, it occurred to me. Uh, June 26th uh, is the first live meeting in 14 months of the Solidarity Singers of uh, the New Jersey Industrial Union. Uh, they're meeting at the American Labor Museum, the Motto House in Haleden, New Jersey, and we're going to be there. We'll see them the first time. The other thing I, it occurred to me, Dean, is you're putting up wonderful videos of things uh, in the past. Uh, we performed at the church many times, but the only one that we have on video is from, I think, 1990. Would you like a link to that? Would you like to post that? Absolutely. Send, send the link and we will, will do. Thanks. We will, we will add it. Um, yeah, there, there are also some cassette recordings in our archives of your performances that we will try to uh, locate and uh, and digitize for you when we have Thank time. You. It's a it's a massive task. <laughs> we know um, massive massive tax task, um, mm. which reminded me also of June twenty sixth, Leonard. That is also the day. I don't know if that's the reason they're gathering, but it's the memorial for uh, Eugene Glickman, who was a choral uh, director and a choral arranger. Um, if any of you know know him and want to be part of I, that virtual gathering, um, I, I've, been, I've been I've been trying to find out about that, and I did not know that that was the date, and, and I didn't know where it was. Where is it? It's it's a virtual program, 
And what and, time is it? Uh, it's at 3 p.m. Saturday, June 26th. No, the, the, the Solidarity Singers meeting is from 12 to 4 in Haldon, and uh, that, that's a conflict, I guess. Uh, I'll try to figure out what to do about that, how to be okay. at once. Do you know where that where that's taking place? That you say it's virtual, but where is the, the central uh, location of the Eugene Glickman Memorial? Whoever is hosting it, his wife, his wife Nancy Hawk, or or is it a good another group? I think it's somebody else who's helping her host the Zoom meeting. Thank you for I'll, telling me about when it. I have a link. I will send you that link, Leonard. Definitely. Okay. Thank you. Dean Ken has had his hand up for a while here. Ken, Ken. Is this your hand up from before or is something new? Go ahead, Ken. Yeah, um, probably it's not appropriate at the moment since we're finishing up, but it did occur to me um, when he was talking whether or not there are any congressmen or senators who would take up his cause and support his letter to the Justice Department. It crossed my mind that Markey, Green Deal, um, you know, but they're probably all scared of Chevron and so forth. But, um, and I want like Union of Concerned Scientists or some other groups that would support his, his efforts. He's probably made, um, you know, tried to make contacts to people who would support him, but maybe we could uh, write a letter to Markey or something and yeah. raise his case and uh, say, well, you're, you know, Green New Deal. Uh, here's somebody who's being you know, badly beaten by, you know, federal power. And could you write a letter to uh, the attorney general on his behalf, et cetera? That's a great idea, Ken. Um, shall we get our heads together, you and I, and we'll draft a letter? Yeah, and, sure. and it could be uh, on Community Church of Boston letterhead. Sure. And uh, I, 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 would, I would really love to, to work with you on that. Okay. Um, a letter to Ed Markey, who we haven't agreed with on on a lot of things, but he is um, supposedly, uh, you know, on the forefront of the environmental movement, Green New Deal with AOC, and all maybe, that stuff. Uh, and maybe the fellow, this, the congressman in Worcester, what's his name? Um, McGovern. Yeah, I mean, he's pretty liberal, you know, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, maybe we could write a couple of people. I think, I think that's a great idea. And... Um, and let's do it and hold hold me to it okay. <laughs> to get it to get it out the door you know what i mean um that's that's what we uh, we brag about our 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 social justice initiative what we've sometimes said is that we don't have a social justice committee we are a social justice committee that's that's what we do that's what we're on the forefront of of doing so um so uh, you know i i really would would love to do another event that that had co-sponsors like i mentioned national lawyers guild has a bo strong boston uh contingent aclu some of the speakers from aclu who have who have spoken uh at community church lawyers for civil rights um union of concerned scientists sierra club the environmental organizations here in Boston, you know, it's um, there's 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 a lot that we could do to put together, a, a, you know, a, a common event, and we could be the, the 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 lightning rod that brings us brings them all together. I'm I'm speaking in a, a high-minded way, uh, and uh, I hope that we get inspired to to do stuff. You know, that's what we want to do is do do more stuff. Shall we adjourn to go outside and enjoy the beautiful summer day? At least up here in Maine, it's just never been more gorgeous. And mm -hmm. I look forward to getting outside, taking a walk, weeding Rachel Nicholas's garden and uh, enjoying some f the company of some friends uh, later on in the day. Thank you, everybody. Uh Dean, before I forget, we had a couple of people trying to beat down the door at Community Church. We forgot about uh, making provisions for that. Yes, we did. My my bad that we made this plan to come up here. I, I notified those who I thought would be down there. Like okay, Carolyn, yeah. is that who was beating down no, the door? No, it was actually um, 
uh, somebody I made a point of telling telling about the program, but um, um, uh, Luis Sanchez. Oh boy. Okay. Well, I will. I will send Luis an apology text. Okay. Thanks, everybody. We're gonna blow out the candle. <laughs> we'll see you again soon. Okay. Love you, everybody. Bye. Take care. And I'm going to copy and paste all this chat. There's a lot of info there. Save chat. And it says chat saved. We got a big thank you from Emily Yozell in, um, in, I wanted, I was hoping Emily would, would join our conversation because she's a lawyer has done environmental class action suits in Costa Rica, but she did not care to, to make a comment. That's okay. We still have nine participants. Let's see. Hi, Jim. Dan is still on. Mary Lynn. Mary Lynn, thank you for sending that uh, that that piece about um, invol involuntary servitude. And I put up that YouTube. I'm going to have a look at it later on today. OK, we're going to scoot out the door. Thank you, Charlie. See you later. Bye, everybody.